So as you know, we have the Tesla factory in the Reno area. Uh, I was there early stages when Tesla actually toured a program that I had started to develop as an instructor when I first went back to teaching, went back into, um, in, in, or back into education. And everything was secret. They were still trying to determine where they're going to put this factory. So you had these people coming in in plain clothes, and they're, you don't know who. They, I knew the Japanese people. I know I've worked for Japanese before. So the guys in the white shirts, what they typically all wear, white shirts and a slack. They're, you know, you know, some type of management somewhere. So I knew we were dealing with some people that came in. And when I discussed our program at the time, as I told them, and I still tell them to this day, this program is for every manufacturer in our area, not just Tesla, Panasonic. We have to focus on the entire area. So to make sure we're focused on those other businesses that are going to be affected, that need those training, those trained people, those upskilling of people. So that was the intent. So building a program around those bases, make sure they're clear that we, yeah, we do things for you, but it's based on a bigger population. It's a bigger need in the entire area. So a little bit about, as you can see, our building up here, uh, Tesla Panasonic H&T. This is just one of our buildings. We went through a remodel a couple years ago. Actually, we we're doing a remodel of this facility two phases when Panasonic and Tesla came in the door. Uh, so they were there when it was a mess. It was interesting. Um, talking about building a workforce for a gigafactory, you know, Reno area is not a manufacturing area. It's more tourist, casinos, uh, service-oriented uh, positions. There are man having come from manufacturers, I know what manufacturers are in that area. I went there as a plant manager for a job. I relocated from Michigan there to the Carson City, which is Reno, south of Reno, uh, for, as a plant manager for food manufacturing, another, another startup. So trying to find people that time, this has been about 2014, trying to find people that time was difficult, uh, especially technical people. Then you'd have someone that might be what I call a shade tree mechanic, worked on a car somewhere, worked on this, worked on that, but they had no technical skills to run highly out, uh, automated equipment or to work on it. So I knew there was a challenge there. So when Tesla came in and we're going, okay, we've got to find technician level people or we've got to train just the basics to even understand manufacturing, it became a challenge because we had no one to draw from. What I did tell the manufacturers is that you have a clean slate. You have people that don't understand manufacturing, but they're a clean slate. So you can start and give them basic skills. There's a high level of interest in a different career path. So I was able to say, we're, we've got a... a, a group of people out here that are going to be highly interested in doing these, and if we can get the skills training, we can able to recruit people in. So, but building that, uh, it's like anyway, it's probably, I think I heard the rumors here too, is like, yeah, we don't know if Tesla's going to come here, or we don't know if Northvolt's going to come here, we don't know, we don't know, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll believe it when we see it, right? Well, when it hits, <laughs> you're too late to prep for it, uh, because once they're there, everything starts rolling very, very, very fast. Uh, the problem we did, I did encounter was for about two years during this process, I had developed a program that was more modular in, in its approach to be able to address all these upskilling needs for incumbent workers, uh, underskilled workers, to try to get their skill levels up to where, where I know manufacturers need to be. But trying to sell that model and people to understand what that meant from a manufacturer's standpoint, they don't understand what that means. They have no idea what education does. They had a little involvement with it. They just go, it's the old Andy, uh, you're not from manufacturing. You're not giving us what we need. And education is going, you're not telling us what, you're not, what you want. So we can never get together. So that's a connection you have to make early on. So trying to get them to understand that, try to, you know, here, it's like for two years processing this with some of the leadership at about a year and a half, I guess, with Panasonic. And then when they finally came to the door, you know, I said, first thing, we've got to endorse programs. You have to. That's how you get people enrolled in programs. When they know there's an employer or ability of a job at the other end of this training somewhere, a possibility for a good paying job, then they'll enter the programs. Until then, they don't want to start paying things out of their pocket and no one else wants to do it. But it took them that long and when they got desperate was when Panasonic walked in the door when I was actually working for the state and they said, I have to hire, the, the HR person says, I need 300 people by the end of the month. That was in December. So 30 days, got to have 300 people hired by the end of the month. Christmas holiday and we're going to do this. this you know, we're coming up on the end of our semester. How are we going to struggle to do this? At that time, I worked for the state. My wife, was the, uh, she was the director at that time. And I had already developed the program. So basically, she put the same stuff. She's much more organized than I am, by the way, because she did a better sales pitch. Put the same stuff in front of them within 
and I'll discuss this a little bit more. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we had a program set to go in pretty quick order, so. Talk a little bit about the size of the gig factory. I know you guys got a big, I don't know what the square footage on North Fort were. What's the square footage? Does anybody tell me? Well, the meter is the size of the facility. It's big, it's gonna be big. Uh, Tesla is somewhere around 10 million to 11 million square feet when it's finished. They're about a third of it done right now. So the square, as you see underneath the line, that's actually what they got at this point. And I know some of you visited, you were walking it. It's a lot of walking, but this area right in here is what they've got. There's the size of our Pentagon, obviously a stadium, just give you some preference. So a lot of real estate. It takes up a lot of land. They have a lot of property out there. We have a very, very big industrial park, some 50,000 square acres, easy. Um, and you could buy uh, land from five acres to 5,000 acres. And we've got you know, several people out there. There's a lot of distribution out there. Uh, Apple's there. Google's bought property there. Uh, Switch is another data warehousing process there out there. Multiple companies keep moving in. And this is about 15 miles outside of Reno. So we have a small commute from our Reno community. And then within our Reno in, in, our area closer by, we actually have more industrial park. So we have Amazon and other ones that built uh, distribution centers there as well. So we have more manufacturing within that area. But this really came to light and actually this industrial park has grown and grown and grown. I think it's the world's largest industrial park. Everybody tries to sell something as the world's largest, but it's pretty stinking big, I know that much. So yeah, it's a lot of land, a lot of square footage, but, and a lot of wild horses, and just high desert. So a little, a little bit about the positive impacts, you know, what we had here, basically uh, talk about rebranding of Reno. Reno was, you know, again, tourist, uh, you know, and, and sell Lake Tahoe, you know, the mountainous resort area, which is very expensive, by the way. And I think I've been to Lake Tahoe twice in the last eight years that I've been there. First time I said I'd never go back, and the second time I said I'll never go back. <laughs> it's crowded. It's extremely crowded. Uh, it's a beautiful area, but they've, like anyone else, they build up around that entire process, around that entire lake. And I don't know if anyone's there had to get a chance to tour it. Looks great in a picture, but boy, there are a lot of people there. You know, we're connected. Half of it's in California side, and half of it's in Reno side. So it's a very expensive houses. You know, some houses approaching 40, 45 million dollars. So yeah, I'm not buying that one. I don't, I don't even rent there. A little shack is, you know, half a million dollars and, not, and they're really not that nice a house. So uh, in the governor's office of economic development report, we had about a 55% increase in manufacturing employment in 2000, since 2014. That's a lot. I know the estimated jobs on these, um, when they said there was about 12,000, somewhere they asked them about 12,000 people working. That was in construction workers as well. So a lot of people on site, every shift they're switching out 6,000 plus vehicles out of there a day. So, and you'd have to understand, we're off of, it's off of a major four lane highway. So it's a split highway, so you would think you would have no traffic jams. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. It's gotten crazy. So, um, but with the net effect, when we figured that, uh, when we were, I was at the state, when we calculated somewhere around 55,000 jobs for the 6,000 jobs that we calculated was in the facility, would be at the facility. If there's more jobs in that, you know, net jobs go more. But 55,000 jobs in a community of 260, 70,000 ish, somewhere in there, that's a heck of an increase in jobs. And your unemployment rate was 8%, maybe somewhere around in there in 2014, 2012. Now we're down less than 4%. And everybody knows unemployment, they understand 5% or less, you're full, on full employment anyways, because 5% of the population is typically unemployable. They don't want to work, can't work, or whatever. Most don't want to. Everybody runs into that problem. So a lot of activities going on there um, and a lot of growth. That's a good thing, right? I talked a little bit about the traffic. 50, went from 5,100 vehicles to 19,000 vehicles a day in three years. And my son was a police officer for the state who covered that area for a couple years. You bring in a lot of new driving habits that you don't see in one state. <laughs> California drivers, and I don't know if likes anybody in California. Uh, I don't know who teaches them to drive, but they need to do a much better job than they do. They don't know what passing means. They don't know what pull, they don't know what left lane in our process is typically the left lane's higher, faster traffic. There it's like, that's a lane. I can drove 10 mile an hour if I want to. They're rude, obnoxious people, and it's gotten crazy. I mean, I'll just give you an example. My son said he clocked 
and with the police, he had some guy doing 140 miles per hour, which I don't know what that is in kilometers, in, in a 45. So, so I wrote him for 100 <laughs> instead of, you know, but, and, and it's crazy. They just, it, it, it gets nuts anyways. But a lot of traffic and one accident, one accident. We had one example last winter, and we don't get a lot of snow, but we get snow. And one accident on a highway shut it down for over six hours. And this is double lanes coming out of Reno, headed so everybody at the factory is late, okay? We have an instructor that works in our facility that lived on the other side of where the Giga factory is and passed it. And it took him almost seven hours to get home. So he might as well stay to work. So that happens. And I, you know, I had to scare everybody to death, but I've been out the road that goes to the factory out here. You need to do some work real quick on that road. <laughs> you better put about eight lanes in there because even at, you know, even when we had a few thousand people starting there, the traffic problem started then. And then the contractors going in and out, the trucks that go in and out, you know, that, that, that's, that's going to be an issue. It's not, you know, and I don't want to scare everybody to death on all of these things because it's a good problem to have. It really is. You've got growth going on. And the amount of growth and the amount of rebranding that's done in Reno right now, we now become a manufacturer. We now we're the spotlights from the world. Obviously, we've seen people from here too. But we see people from all over the place, Italy, everything coming to visit us. And they look at what we do at TMCC is how are you handling that mass amount of people that you've got to train? Well, there's a trick to that. And there was some finessing going on. Um, again, services. You know, we always forget about that. You know, there's a lot of, uh, Tessa, because of the remote location, there's no restaurants in that area. There, there was one gas station with a subway or something in it. And now there's a few restaurants going up. There's a hotel going in this industrial park. But right now, Tessa has such a last, they have their own restaurants in their facilities. They have multiples too. They have Chinese, Mexican, American, so they can go in different places in the facility and get different selections of food. But for a while, they were doing food trucks. They have, and they still do them today. They have 12 or 15 food trucks. And these guys are vendors. They come out in these fancy food trucks, and they just park out the parking lot and cook whatever you want. So they have those out there as well. Parking was a huge issue for them at first. Uh, and they'll keep taking up more of their parking lot. I don't know how they're going to do this. But when you get, you know, eventually they're talking somewhere around 10,000 to 12,000 people at that facility, just workers in the factory. So you can imagine shift change. You, know, you don't want to go anywhere near shift change, you know. So, so everybody's going to work out here. They're three shift operation. Figure out their hours. And don't go around time. I'm staying away from there until then. So you'll get through it. So uh, anywhere, again, uh, primary on school systems. It helps, hurts us there. You know, we had a, net of, a huge effect on our school system. We're building new schools. Tesla did make a commitment to put uh, part of the tax break. They had to put $35 million into the school system, into our K-12 system. So they're solely working on that. They work on a lot of other projects with us too. Uh, but they're really doing a lot of outreach, by the way, to the K-12 systems, our, our lower level division. So, and do a lot of work in that effort to get students at a younger age interested in manufacturing. I grew up in a state where manufacturing was very heavy. The automotive industry, food production. Kellogg's was Battle Creek, and I, Battle Creek, Michigan, and I grew up right there. I worked in Battle Creek, and I worked for them for years. So everybody knew Kellogg's. Everybody knew General Motors. Everybody knew Ford. So we're used to that manufacturing environment. Uh, so we know, you know, there's a career. We know that those jobs aren't dirty jobs. They're high-tech jobs. They're high-demand jobs, and they're high-pay jobs. We know that. But you go to a state where they don't have much manufacturing, and the only manufacturing they do is maybe some small production operation that's a machine, some type of machine tool, it's a greasy, dirty shop. They're used to that. Or they're used to some, we have a couple of sandwich, I call them sandwich assembly places. SNK Food just basically makes sandwiches and puts them in bags and freezes them, sells people. You know, those aren't the food manufacturing that, you know, I'm used to and the rest of the people that are from the Midwest understand what manufacturing looks like. Robotics in the room. I'm used to, Kellogg's is a fully automated facility um, and it was a huge project. My people, my employees sat in control rooms and watched computer screens and watched monitors and made adjustments on food process from a control room, a, you know, a nice uh, climate control, control room where they're just sitting there doing their stuff and filling out reports. So take samples once in a while, but, not, but so that process, they didn't understand that. So trying to get them to think outside of the box, we had to resell manufacturing. 
we had to say, it's not the dirty job, it's not the greasy job, and it's not just some redundant low-paid job. We expect high skills, it's high pay, and it's good employment. And within that environment that they don't understand, we have to tell students and parents as well, is that there are career opportunities to move. So you may start down here as an operator today. A few years from now, you may be in maintenance or something, some type of higher level technician. If you continue to go to school and get your training, now all of a sudden you may be an engineering, in the engineering department someplace else. And pretty soon you may be running the facility. That opportunity is there within manufacturing. Okay, so gives you a lot more experience and, and, and you know, just across the board and, and management and robotics and controls and quality control. And there's just a, a plethora of jobs and opportunity within manufacturing. Excuse me, I gotta get a drink. I'm getting dry now. I told them don't let me talk too long. A um, little bit of negative, and, I, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you the truth, so if somebody, it's a good thing my boss isn't right here because, oh, don't, don't do that. So no, no, that's the way it is. So a challenge is what we had. Did I go past one? I think we're good. How do we train thousands of people, how thousands of students in basic manufacturing skills quickly? Because that's what happened to us, okay? When they said, we need people with some type of manufacturing skills. How do we do it? We got a growing interest. We got to give them a growing interest in manufacturing careers. We got to create that environment. We have to start that at a lower level. We got to get it here because people don't understand it. But we also got to maintain that pipeline, right? We got to build a pipeline. So building a few short months, we had to do this just entry level skills because they didn't have them. They had no manufacturing background at all. A very a handful, and that was minimal. Nothing at this scale. And then again, how do we contain or how do we keep building that consistent pipeline? Because we can say we're training, we're, like we're behind. We've got to train them for now, but we also got to keep training them for the future. So that's the challenge, you know, again, retraining, reteaching, you know, re, I guess, branding manufacturing. You know, that is a difficult task. And we still do that today. I'm sure some of you still have those problems with young adults thinking, I'm not going to work in manufacturing. That's a lousy job. Uh, but it's not true. So we had to develop a program that basically flexible for employers, for incumbent workers, for underskilled people. We make sure that it was scalable, cost effective, and they had offered choices. So we had content that was selectable by employers, and it was also provided individual pay as you go for people who had to pay out of their pocket. There's nothing worse than going to college and say, okay, here you go, student. You take these classes. Oh, by the way, hurry up and pay. And, you know, it costs you $1,000 for three classes or $1,200 for three classes. If you're underemployed and you're trying to upskill yourself, $1,000 out of your pocket is a lot of money. And some of them can get student loans, some can't. Some people don't want to borrow money. They want to pay. With the ability, what we've done with this model is it's small, so small of payments, they can actually start something for $50 to $60 U.S. and continue and then complete that and continue to go. Do this right? It takes a partnership, a true partnership. And I'll stress this multiple times. And we're going to talk tomorrow again at a, a municipality. I think I never spit that morning meeting. Talk with more employers. And I am going to push them to understand you can't complain if you're not getting involved. Okay? Don't come to the table and, oh, excuse me, bitch, if you're not going to help do something about it. You complain, 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 and I hear it. I still hear it today. We get in state meetings where there's a pol political officials there, and inevitably that an employer that's mad about something is going to come and complain. Well, you're giving all that to Tesla, or you're giving all that to this company. Where am I? And I go, you're right. Where were you? Where have you been? Because we have told you multiple times, come see us. We can help you with this. There's money available for apprenticeships, there's funding available, we can help you do something. So quit complaining. So anyways, we wanted to make sure the importance of benefit is, you know, for partnership with TMCC. From us, perspective, you know, we get endorsed, industry endorsed programs. So that's a struggle to get an employer and a, a, a company to say, stamp of approval on this program. Anybody coming on here, we guarantee we'll at least have an interview with our company. And that was one of the process we said, we'll go through this. We want to guarantee they at least get an interview. Panasonic stepped up and said they would. Some got hired. Some did not. 
some said, some of them, they'd say, if you go through the program and come back to talk in six months, we'll give you a job. Because they knew the benefit of the program that we were running. Again, uh, you know, direct finance investment, they did some help with us. Tesla did some as far as monetary into the um, community to their $35 million. Uh, they've actually given us some donation recently. Well, there's times when they give you the money, they tell you what you want to do with it. And I'm, I'm the guy who says, no, I'll tell you what I'm going to do with it. And here's what I'm going to do. So we can hit, take some direct, but it's, it's, we have some rules around that. So we have to be careful. Um, but it, we, they helped us increase our capacity. And I'll say that by saying that when you put students in a program, when you endorse a program, you increase enrollment. People all of a sudden want to come take that program because there's a job at the end of it, the training. They see a job opportunity at the end of it. When enrollment goes up, that's in education, your money goes up. More money coming to the program. Obviously, we're going to benefit out of that. We get what we call FTE, which is full-time equivalency. It's really weird. It's how we get funded through the state because we don't have free education. We get funding based on completers. We get funding based on a lot of other things. It just doesn't, it's not automatic. They have to pay for them. So again, we were able to help them in some employee orientation with Panasonic. They were trying to, once they got to those numbers, they were going through groups of 100 to 200 people in groups and running these orientations to get them hired. So doing these exercises on team building and so on and so forth. We're able to give some spaces for hiring. So benefits, you know, we help do that too. Um, so there's a lot of things that we could actually help with the company with. So any educational entity can do that. They have the opportunity to go out and say, we have a facility, we have resources. How about doing your hiring event here? You know, which highlights the fact that you're in a facility where the programs are running. Students come there, parents come there for us. Other adults come in, but they come in and look, and they say, ooh, I didn't know you did this. Ooh, I didn't know they did that. I didn't know this. Yes, well, here's a program. Do this, this, and this. So, you know, it, it's a lot of benefits from, from, the, from our organization. Helped them tremendously, especially growth, because it, it uh, I guess we got the awareness of the availability of this training. Because I don't know if anyone has that issue. I know you've got limitations on numbers, correct? Is that how your vocational, your upper, is that? I'm trying to understand your educational system, but... You're, are you limited on how many seats you can put? Is that correct? So, which I, I, we have schools like that, but they're called charter schools and they take applications, and, but we don't do that. We, we train, okay? And we train whoever comes in the door. Uh, and it, we train it however long it takes them to do it. And so with our model, they can take as long as they need to or they can get done as quickly as they, as they want to. So uh, I think I covered everything there. Let's go forward. Obviously, the benefits in for the Gigafactory, uh, again, working with it, we can help them identify any training gaps, uh, ability to determine what's best for individual organizations, our, our menu approach. And I'll get to this a little bit later. You know, every, as I said, it's that flexibility for the content delivery is we didn't create, now let me go on farther down. I'll, I'll get to that later. I'll talk over ahead of myself. Um, it gives you the ability, here's one of the, one of the key notes, but key, key points here in this slide, is industry gains an understanding of the skill sets, the skill sets that you're training. We have multiple certificates of achievement, the lower level, we have skill certificates, we do stackable, so skill certificate for us is about six units, six credits to anywhere to, we can do them six to about nine or somewhere in there. And then, uh, then our certificate achievements are about 24 to 27 credits. Typically, it's usually all the technical content. That's just straight technical. If you would like an associate's degree, which is a two-year degree, then what you end up doing is um, you'll have, you can take all those stackables, then you just do your gen ed classes, your English, your biology, your science, all those courses. Add on to that to an associate's degree. And actually, I've created a Bachelor's of Applied Science. Can everybody hear me? There goes. Sorry. I'm jiggling. It's choking. This minute. Okay. I'm not used to this thing. It tickles my ear, by the way. We've actually stackable credentials. So no one has to go back and repeat. You don't got to do something. We're going to stack it from the bottom to the top. So employers are able to go in and choose and pick what helps them. Okay. So what they need for their organization. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but that, that understanding of those 
certificates, which is where it comes in a little bit later with Panasonic, is that we are able to create what we call, and I'll show that, a P3 certificate. So the pan, pan, came up with this thing real quick, Panasonic Preferred Pathway, P3. And they chose content based on the modular, the module approach or the modularity of what we've done with our courses. We've broken them down. Uh, so they specifically what hit the immediate need, which was a very introductory, which we actually had production technician as well, and we have automation and robotics as well. They picked the courses and those contests specifically helped those skill sets as entry level. So, and we'll talk a little bit more here in just a second about that. Again, benefits from them too. Uh, we actually increased the number of hires for the M2 operator, which is the level that they made. Development days, two days of orientation training, we helped them do that. Uh, develop plans for incumbent worker training, higher level skill training, because that's what we're hitting now is that next level. Uh, we're working with apprenticeship models as well as trying to, um, the internal workings of their lower level technicians to the higher level technicians, all the way up to the engineering technicians. They just have the name of different levels. Uh, working with local school districts, by training to high schools. We're actually trained, we have dual enrollment programs, dual credit. We have students that actually are high school students going through the same program. They get credit from both sides and Tessa looks at them as well. Uh, so we have a mix of things going on within our organization that try to affect, it's, it's having a huge impact uh, on the entire area and it's a, mind, it's a mind switch. It's a thinking switch. It's completely switched what people thought before. The results, I'll get to this. <coughs> Excuse me. The P3 program, and this was just a marketing thing we put together, and I'll tell you time frames in a minute, with Panasonic. This is the first one. Tesla was still outside the picture. We didn't actually, I'll be honest with you, we didn't know Panasonic was part of this facility. They were so private, so secretive about the other. Panasonic wasn't even allowed to talk uh, that they were in that facility for a long time uh, until they started getting desperate for people, and then they were allowed to come talk, but they really weren't, no one knew that. It was just Tesla Gigafactory. That's all we got out of this. Uh, so I found that a little weird, but who knows. So this was just an example. They wanted just a material handler. This was about 80 hours to complete. So what we did, well, let me go through this first. So you can just see a couple, you know, basic material handling equipment, safety and effective equipment, house, uh, automated concepts, uh, 5S principles, precision, and general industry safety. Something went together. That's what they picked out of our stuff and said, let's do this. And that's that's that level, entry level. It's all we want, basic skills. We can go from there, but remember, they're trying to fill thousands of jobs in a very short order in an area that has no manufacturing background. So the first thing we gotta do is get somebody to at least understand safety and some of the basics of manufacturing. How do you work in an industrial setting? Got another one, next one's about 120 hours. This is a production operator. So again, they chose, you'll notice the things on this side say M, and I'll explain that in a few minutes but you also notice that they're half credit, okay? Half credit increments. So a total of six credits on this. And they, we created, after this was done, we actually created certificates so that as a college, we we're able to count that student as a completer. Because in our state, it says you gotta have a completer in order to get funded. They wanna know how many completers you got in your program. If you don't get completers, and anybody that works in any trades or any industrial application or any type of or our skills or our applied technologies courses, students get jobs long before they get the certificate or a degree. Usually after three or four classes, Paul's background has been automotive. The automotive guys are getting grabbed up. After two or three classes, they got a job. Well, then they'll come back to school. So it looks like we don't have any completion rates in our program. It doesn't look like it's successful. So we had to go back and look and say, wait a minute, they're all in a job. Isn't that what we want? We want them to get the job they're like. We want them a good paying, you know, what, you know uh, family sustaining wages and they're, they're successful. That's a completer. Okay, but in the academic world, they look at it differently. So we're able to create those certificates to help us in an applied technologies facility, vocational, you like to, to actually show up as a completer. How much time do you think? This is a question that everybody asks. How much time do you think it actually took to build that M1 and M2 program you just saw? It is a lot less than you spent on your phone, I'm telling you right now, a lot less. About 30 minutes. It took about 30 minutes. Keep in mind the structure was there, okay? 
I put the structure in place. We did nothing to lower our standards. We did nothing to lower the credits or the acceptability of the program. We did nothing to our degrees. All we simply did, a simple change. Oh, initial, oh here's another question before I get to this. How long do you think it took us to, <laughs> to do this entire initiative P3 rollout? You know, you'd think months, right? Three weeks. We were done in three weeks. So we're rolling this out with people in the program in three weeks. So people go, how the heck are you going to do that? Well, that was all of these things going on. Scholarships, press releases, all that within about three weeks. There was some work going on, that's for sure. There you go. Can you do that that fast? I'm thinking not. I've heard rumors. I don't think so. It's not complicated. It takes thinking outside the box. That's all you've got to do. It takes involvement from employers to support that change. And here specifically, you need heavy involvement from employers to support that change. So you need them at the table for your government officials to say, we need to see some changes in education. We need to see this because of the growth you have. We need to see it now. How do we change it? And some, some may be able to do it. Some of you that are in politics are going, yeah, this would be a struggle. But if you have enough people at the table that are screaming and hollering, as they say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, you got to make sure you have enough people there. But don't forget all the other employers in the room, all the other employers in your area. They have to be there too. They have to be in the room. Let me see if I can go forward here. Timeline, 2013, got a first tech grant. We started building the advanced venue program. Uh, 2014, we announced it. And then somewhere around there, we ended up with over 6,000 positions being created, capacity problem. We had some issues we had to deal with. So it came across quick. Can it be, how can it be done? <laughs> I said, I can do this, no problem. Just let me go, All right? Yeah. It's, I always volunteer for these things. I'm the guy that says, yeah, we can do it. And then they look at you and go, okay. Do it. So then I always get myself in more trouble, more projects, and more things. It's, it's okay. Having spent many years in manufacturing, you, just, you get used to just doing this. And it benefits everyone. I mean, I'm here for the benefit of the students, but benefit of the college, but benefit of the community, the companies. Because I know those jobs go through a lot. You know, they're, manufacturing to me is a little bit more recession-proof. I, I love my analogy, it's Kellogg's, cereals. This, people, people <laughs> if they're broke, they still eat. Okay, if they're happy, they eat. You know, if they're working, they eat. And they like cereal. Can't go wrong. So I'm just going to make cereal. Keep punching it out the door. Works well. People buy cornflakes because it's cheap. Traditional course delivery. Talk about this. This is, this is one of the things where I had to do some convincing. I hope I don't go too far. In a traditional delivery format, can I get some more water? Um, excuse me. Oops. Okay. Spill it. Sorry, folks, I'm dry. <laughs> I'm talking too much or something here. Am I going too fast? I'm sorry, I hope I'm not. Can you understand me? Oh my God, you understand a Midwest accent. That's awesome. <laughs> I told you it's not that confusing. I'm picking up a little bit of the language here, by the way. I, I'm doing my iPhone thing in Duolingo. So... I can actually read more of it than I can. I can't speak it yet. Don't ask me to do that. Yes. Oh, yeah. Shh. Is that right? Yeah, all right. I got something right. I'm going to try to remember. I'm going to go home. My wife asked me something. I go, shh. Yeah. What? I answered you. Didn't you hear me? And I'm going to tell her, call you. No, I better be careful because I know I'll get in trouble, trust me. And she's the boss at home and at work, so I have to be careful what I do. We've been in conferences before, and I remember I will talk. It, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I hate public speaking. I avoided speech class for like five years because I was scared. But when you find something you're passionate about, you'll talk about it. If you told me to do a speech on, I would die. I don't know, I can't read it, I couldn't get it, so... But I've been through this process. I believe in what we've done. The success is there. We still have our challenges. But we've come a long, long ways, and the areas benefited greatly 
from those changes, and I knew they would. Traditional format. It's, uh, it's my way or the highway. I'm the instructor here. We're the college. We're going to say, okay, if I have two full-time instructors, they get a couple classes, two classrooms maybe, a shared lab. So and you're trying to schedule around that problems. Typically, it's maybe one classroom, you know, one t- teacher. So you're somewhere to 30 to 40 students annually. That's what you get out of it. That's all you're going to get. Your equipment limitations, there's a lot of things you could do. You're going to, I got to have, if I'm trying to put all students in a lab, I have to have at least half of the amount of student to equipment ratio. I have to. So I need 15 pieces of equipment, okay? And some of the equipment we purchase, that's an expensive endeavor, okay? Because you want two, over two on a, any type of lab situation, hands-on assessment, they're not going to gain it. They're, even then, someone's probably doing the work. They might share a little bit. But if you get three or four people in a lab assignment and hands-on assessment and say, let's train around this piece of equipment, I want you to do this with this, one of them doing the work, three of them are standing around. And they all write the same paper. Who gets the grade? I don't know. Can you watch that man in the lab? You can't. It's very difficult to do it. So space limitations, equipment limitations, you're really not getting the hands-on skills that they need. So, and I know the trades guy probably understands this. You need that hands-on application somewhere in here. Click. A simple change. Thinking outside the box. That's all it takes. So each class now, keep in mind, our classes are usually three to four credits, okay? We use the ratio of 20 contact hours equals one credit. That's what we had originally. Um, and we've changed that a little bit. But So we say, okay, half credit is typically about 10 contact hours. If three credits is this, then you know six, it should be 60 hours, then it should be about this much. So I broke every one of them down into half credit. Now we know we have objectives and outcomes for every course that we teach. They're there. Students will do this, students will do this, they'll learn this, we'll assess, 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 and here's how we do that we, so we can compare. We know we can do that. All we had to do was go in there and go, well, these are the major areas that we want to cover within that course. In a traditional course, you would sit in that seat, you would sit in that seat for 60 hours sometime through the semester. That's all you'd be required to do, sit in the seats and hopefully do something. Read and regurgitate, take a test, right? Now, broke that down, each module, three steps. Online reading assignments, which we all as instructors, any teachers do the same thing. Here's your reading. Make sure you read this, do this, do this, do this. There'll be a test next week. That's it. Come back, test you, okay? And then you're done. We don't want that. Manufacturers don't want that. They want competencies. I want demonstrated competencies. A test isn't a competency to me. I want to see them demonstrate. I want to see them do something. So most of our, not every, because there's some of the real theoretical pieces, calculations in Ohm's Law and some electrical theory. You know, we do some, but we do small circuits. But typically, they're there. So reading, they do quizzes, and then every time, so every half, incre- every half credit module, which now the whole course is broken down into modules, is like, here's your assignments, here's your reading. We have what we call a resource center. Do we have pictures of that? We didn't do that, did we? We have a resource center in our facility now, which is basically a library, a study area, and a testing area because they can come in and ask questions. Then the instructor sits, is in the lab. We run about 60 hours a week, 65 hours a week. We run Saturdays, I've run Sundays before to handle the flow of people that we come in. We don't have to, but we do for convenience. We can adjust our model that way. They do their reading, they do the quizzes, anything theoretical, any supplemental material we can get, just like you do any other assignments. Uh, their books, they don't pay for books. We give them for free. Um, and then they do some quizzes, self-check quizzes like anyone else would do. You know, we grade them. We give them some tests on them. We give them mul- mul- multiple opportunities to do that. Then there's some type of hands-on assessment, so a hands-on lab. That instructor is in that lab area constantly. So if a student has a question, they can come there and ask. They're accessible better than office hours, okay? Better than a lecture of 300 people in a room. Because I guarantee you, having done all of this teaching every which way you can think of, that you'll ask anybody have any questions, 99% of the people will go, because they're afraid to ask a question. They won't ask one. You could ask, what questions do you have? Maybe you get one or two. Most people will not talk because they're afraid they're gonna ask, especially adults. Adult learners are terrible because they're scared. They either had bad experience in school before, they think they were a terrible student, but coming back to school for them, 
is more terrifying than a high school kid going to college. And they might not think so, but they're not used to it. And they're afraid. They've got all these young people in there. If I say something stupid, I'm going to sound even stupider. So they don't want to. But in this environment, it's comfortable. It's open. The instructors, they're, they're approachable. So they can go one-on-one -on -one with you and ask a question or one-on-one -on -one with you and ask a question. And they don't have to have the rest of the room. Every student within that program, though, are at different levels. We have no time base in there. We say it's an average about this many hours. Okay? We know we have enough content to cover at least that. Some take much longer. They take much longer to go through the theory. They might not get through the hands-on assessment. We don't say you got to have it done in two hours. We say you have to have it done before the end of the semester, the complete course. That's our time limitations. It's not open-ended. It's closed at the very end. So, but they have several months to complete their modules. They sign up for what they want. But employers can step them through the process. We can share information with employers and say, okay, John over here is doing exemplary work. He's going through the program much faster. His, his grades are demonstrating here. We don't grade on an A, B, C, D, E, F grade. We go A, B, F. So if you don't have 80% or better average on your scores, you have to have 100% on the hands-on, 80% on the written theoretical, the test, the, the, the proctor test, because we do proctor tests as well. At the end of everything is a test, so they have to test out of this. If they don't do 80% or better, they fail. 79.9, they fail. We give them an F. We want every employer to understand that you're not getting a C student or a D student. This person is at least 80% or higher. So you're getting the B and the A student on our grading scale. We know we can show that. So when they come out of the program, they know what they're getting. Okay. It didn't take much to do that. It took, it took me about a year process as I had to demonstrate that the model was valuable to some leadership. So it actually took them to a school I'd worked at in Michigan where this, actually this whole model started some years ago, back in the 80s. And I used it as an employer for my employees. It's a very successful model. It's a very successful apprenticeships. You have the open entry, open exit, basically. You can send employees around their work schedules. You can modulize it to fit your, your need and your facility, specifically to you, okay? But everybody's got the opportunity for the entire thing. So you can grow them from there. You can start low, low skills, up skills, whatever you want to do. You can continue to grow this program. You can start with the lowest level. We go next to the maintenance level, the next level up, technician level, and so on and so forth. And with the stackable credentials, we were able to produce this. Our lab environment, sorry, back into breaking these down a little bit. You can see some of this. This is like our ELM 110 class. So you can see where we've broken down. It's a four credit class, so it's eight modules. Even in a traditional class, you would follow this through. They'd go through every one of those. Delivery is the same, but they follow that same path. Again, stackable credentials. You can see over here on the right where we do some of the courses. i get this correct. Um, these ones right here. So this is the M1, M2, this is the skill certificate PLCs, industrial electricity, and then we have our certificate of achievement advanced manufacturing. It continues on from there, so we continue more. It goes up to an associate's degree. Come on. Go. Capacity, we run from there, shared lab 30 per year. Traditional delivery, modulized is that. When I came back into teaching in this program that I left for a couple years ago, worked for the state, I had over 600 students in the program. I was the only full-time instructor. Never saw it crowded. Till the end of the semester, you get the procrastinators. But I handled them rather well because I'm an old manager. I said, not my problem. Should have showed up sooner. And I give no one a break. I don't cut. I said, the job, I wouldn't give you a break on the job. If you didn't show up more doing your job, you don't have a job. I said, and that's the world's going to teach you that. So get used to it now. Free education. We actually had funding to go through these things. So some took advantage of that. But we had a lot. To there just a second. So that's where we're at today. We've got a new VS, VAS program, 600 students per year. We're probably down about 450 to 500 right now this semester. It says we had a lot of completers, but we get, we get literally, out of the one semester, we've put over 6,000 grades in. We have to put grades in a two day period. So 6,000 grades go in for students. That's the amount of modules. So you imagine the amount of credit we're generating for the school. A little bit of our lab areas. This is one, I just actually moved the robots around for Tessa. Well, this is like a, a more of our, well, we have some of our basic in here, robotics, and then this is our uh, kind of a middle of the road, our intermediate, and then this is our industry 4.0. I'm heavy in industry 4.0 certifications right now, working with uh, Festo Didactic on that too. So, future. Um, scalable, 
flexible content, flexible delivery, ready-made asset to the region. Okay, these are benefits. It truly is. Once they understand, and it's not hurting your educational quality. It will not hurt the quality. It's just making you think about how you're delivering this. You're not standing in a classroom lecturing. You're actually going to have them ask you questions. You're actually going to have them do something to demonstrate that skill. We all want that. And the students love to learn when they can do something. They learn much better when they can apply it somewhere. Where we are today, we don't need no more pre-employment. Uh, we got programs going on right now for upskilling. This is what we're working with Tesla and Panasonic right now. Uh, partnership with the K-12, get the pipeline in. We actually do work with them a lot. Um, more offering, more career-related opportunities for students, and then we pursuing upskilling additional employers in the area. You finally get them on board. You know, it's always the steal from this one, the steal from that one. But you know, there's a lot of problems with that as well. But the other positive, one of the things going on right now, which is another project we get into all the time, they come to us at that. So we have a company called Reno Land Development that's actually building a quad set of quad set of buildings and one of the corner buildings, 40 some thousand square feet. They want TMCC to bring their programs out to that industrial park. Uh, on top of that, Tesla has their plan going on, which we didn't know about. They have a building that they're actually wanting us to lease. They want us to put their training center there, which is around the corner from them. And then Panasonic has 400 plus employees. They want to train at a higher level that they want us to do on site with them. So we're Getting a lot of requests real quick. The model works. Oh, sorry, back up. That's all I got to say. I talked too much probably. I went way over my time. I, I thought I was going to take 10 minutes. <laughs>